Um, thank you, Stephen and Brett, for your insightful remarks. Uh, Michael Green from the Department of Economic Development here in Victoria. Um, we've heard, uh, I think, uh, Brett talk about the appetite for social privatisation. Uh, my question is to Stephen and ask him uh, what has contributed to the public distrust of social privatisation and what more could financial sector leaders like Brett do to build public confidence in that agenda? Uh, that's an interesting query. I mean, if I look at the most recent election, which was the Queensland election, uh, you saw a strong privatisation agenda that was being run by the former Queensland government. Uh, and I'm not sure what different people's views are, but uh, I think it'd be fair to say that the consensus commentariat view was that uh, the primary reason the Queensland government lost that election was because uh, they were looking at privatising key infrastructure. Um, so I'm not sure if that cuts across the question you asked. Uh, clearly there remains, and perhaps it's state by state, Maybe it varies market to market. Um, but clearly there remains a desire for assets to remain in public hands. Um, frankly, I find it curious. Uh, I, for the life of me, cannot understand why the population would want to own a business that diminishes in value every single day. Uh, Poles and Wires businesses, for example, in Queensland, uh, is not a good business to be in. Uh, in Victoria, we've seen, uh, and I'm using this off the top of my head, uh, but I think the lowest additional costs passed on to consumers through your privatised model uh, than you saw in terms of transmission costs or network charges, for lack of a better term, um, uh, versus states like Queensland where it remains in public ownership. So I think the other challenge that you've got in the space, and this is something that I've turned my mind to, is we've also seen many examples of PPPs that have been very unfruitful. Uh, New South Wales is home to a number of them, but Queensland's got its fair share as well, and I'm not familiar enough with Victoria's uh, to be able to comment on any specific projects. But that notwithstanding, uh, clearly there is some private sector concern, as is, I think, probably appropriate, given, um, given some of the losses that we've seen. And let's be frank, uh, the recent election of the Victorian government just highlights that there, I'm sure in the minds of many private sector operators, is a very significant sovereign risk with substantial changes of policy on, on those types of investments. So is that ultimately going to have a long-term impact? I guess time will tell. But I think we need to be mindful of it. Well, the, the, only, the only thing I'd add is that we clearly have a role to play. Uh, we, we, and, and part of that is, you know, what we're, like we're trying to do today is distinguish between what some might regard as privatisation and all the bad things that are associated with that. You know, short-term owners, not considering the needs of employees, not considering the needs of customers, and, and long-term owners. Uh, so there, there, is, there is various forms of privatisation. Um, there are forms that have worked for investors and have worked for communities. And let's, let's look at trying to model the ones that have worked for both. Ben, you had a question down. There's a microphone down the front. Uh, it's Ben Potter from the Australian Financial Review. Um, Steve, uh, everyone in the room is wondering um, what your uh, true inner thoughts are on, on this. So can you tell us if there is uh, a, a, a spill motion, another spill motion <laughs> against the Prime Minister brewing um, in the next fortnight or not? Um, and Brett, I'd be interested in your views on um, the impact of the cancellation of the East-West contract. Uh, project contract on the appetite of um, investors, especially foreign investors, but investors of all stripes uh, for future PPPs, privatisations and so on in Victoria. There's a lot of talk about sovereign risk and a little bit of uh, suggestion that, or a lot from the government, that there are mitigating circumstances in the East-West Link projects. So I'd be interested in, in your views on that. Thanks. No. <laughs> That's all I've got to say. <laughs> okay, looks like I'm up. <laughs> the uh, the east-west uh, cancellation is uh, it's disappointing. Um, it's disappointing for uh, many investors that put a lot of time and energy and analysis into determining the risk and return of that and. Uh, ultimately decided to commit capital. Uh, that takes a long time and it takes a lot of money and to 
have that cancelled is is clearly disappointing. Um, it, the other question that you sort of posed around it is what's the reaction from uh, investors, particularly foreign ones? Uh, Australia has traditionally, and I think generally still, is regarded as a, uh, an, a, a sound and interesting and attractive place to invest. So whilst there's a little bit of concern about the signal this sends, I think sitting above that is a country that is seen to be one where the rule of law and the enforceability of contract is strong. Uh, and so that's something that encourages investors. Uh, the other thing I would add is, uh, is that we're probably a pretty uh, pragmatic bunch and absent a whole lot of deal supply in this country or around the world, um, you know, we'll probably get over it and look for the next opportunity that might be forthcoming, which of course is the Port of Melbourne. Uh, and, you know, the government here has clearly announced a timetable to, uh, to look to uh, socially privatise that. Thanks, Brett. Next question. Right, thank you. Just over here on the right. Minister, were you surprised by the strength of the property industry's reaction to the announcement the other day about uh, administrative fees that would be applied to FERB applications from offshore investors in property, both residential and agricultural? Um, here in Victoria, we've actually got a situation where a number of people have questioned whether or not the fees were high enough. The property industry says they're too high. In other words, what is the measure of disincentive involved? But you've also got the situation where the offshore investors in agriculture, for example, we've got concrete cases in this state where they've aggregated a series of investments that could be deemed to be of themselves relatively small, but in aggregate become quite significant in the dairy sector, for example, become the basis of a significant export industry. What is the rationale for dealing with cases like that? Uh, I can truthfully say I wasn't surprised that um, elements of industry squealed. I th think that's uh, pretty much what happens when stakeholders uh, experience change. Uh, but truthfully, as in my previous role as the person who had oversight of Australia's um, housing supply uh, at a federal level, which frankly doesn't account for much because the bulk of it is state government and local government. Um, the fact remains that the government's policy paper that we've put forward in, of additional charges for FERB applications, that is Foreign Investment Review Board applications, uh, is at the very best marginal. I mean, the fees we are talking about are very, very moderate and I think entirely consistent uh, with a uh, revenue replacement model uh, to cover the cost of uh, enhanced enforcement of the current of the existing framework of laws. So we're not changing the framework of laws. What we're looking to do is to effectively have cost recovery uh, to ensure that it's more appropriately policed. I think the community expects government to do that. I don't believe for one moment uh, that the sums involved are going to dissuade anybody uh, from investing. Uh, furthermore, if you look at it on a comparative basis, uh, what we are talking about is insubstantial compared with additional levies in places like, for example, Hong Kong and Singapore. So I don't believe that will be an impact. Uh, in relation to your question about aggregation, uh, the policy approach currently is to look at the aggregated value and to use that total as the figure that would trigger uh, any closer scrutiny. So for example, in relation to agriculture, uh, the new threshold is $15 million. Uh, if there was, for lack of a better term, creeping acquisitions over a period of time, uh, that, would, that would trigger that threshold. Josh. Uh, Stephen, apologies, but just to follow on from my colleague. Um, after the vote on whether or not to have a, a leadership spill, Tony Abbott said, good government starts today. Since then, businesses have expressed concern about the ongoing leadership uh, speculation and the impact that's having on investor confidence and the ability to prosecute arguments about economic reform and that sort of thing. Do you think the federal government is delivering good government at the moment? 
And how do you respond to those concerns about the instability in Canberra and the impact on investor confidence? I absolutely do believe the uh, Federal Coalition is delivering good government. Uh, if you look at the key platform upon which we were elected, uh, we said that we were going to abolish the carbon tax, we've done that. We said that we were going to abolish the mining tax, we've done that. We said we were going to stop the boats, uh, we've achieved that. Uh, we've reduced uh, significantly the number of, for example, an issue that's running hot at the moment, children in detention. We've reduced that from more than 2,000 to now less than 200. Uh, if you look at the impact that that's had uh, overall in terms of the whole people smuggling uh, operation that was in effect under Labor's weakened border protection laws, where we had 50,000 people of which 8,400 were children. Uh, you know, we have stopped that trade. We've stopped that illegal trade. And that's a very big positive. And, and Im importantly, the impact on the budget is the budget is now better off to the tune of several billion dollars. So uh, just on those measures alone, I think we've achieved some very important outcomes. Um, the most significant of all, though, was our commitment to the Australian people to make sure that Australia lived within its means and to making sure that we had fiscal consolidation so that as a nation we weren't continuing to get ourselves mired in more and more debt. Now we're currently as a nation borrowing $100 million a day to pay for our suite of policies that we've been bequeathed from the former Labor government. Uh, as a new government, we're still a relatively new government, 18 months in, uh, we've attempted to implement a range of reforms to achieve structural reform of the like that I spoke about in my speech uh, to put us on a more sustainable footing. Now, some of that has been rejected by the Senate. The impact of the Senate's changes uh, and the Senate's rejection of reforms that we've put forward uh, is to see us as a nation continue to face very significant uh, spending challenges that mean that we continue to live well beyond our means. Uh, $100 million a day, more than a billion dollars a month spent on just servicing the interest costs, uh, and that's forecast to reach $2.8 billion per month of money being spent, borrowed and spent, on interest payments on the debt that we've been left behind. So, believe you me, I am incredibly focused on it as a government, we're very focused on it. Uh, Australia cannot continue on the pathway that we're on. And that's why I and other members of the government find it so jarring uh, that, frankly, uh, claims from opposition members that the last budget was inequitable uh, completely betray the fact that the greatest single inequity that exists, I believe, in the political landscape today uh, is the very sweet but, unfortunately, uh, inaccurate siren song that we can continue to have the policies that we currently have, borrowing from the next generation will have to pay for it. So I think as a government we have achieved a lot uh, and we remain steadfastly focused on trying to achieve more in terms of fiscal consolidation. Uh, as I and the government have said on numerous occasions, uh, there are currently $5 billion worth of savings that the Labor Party identified that they would be savings taken by the Labor Party which we are now trying to implement and pass through the Senate, which now Labor's rejecting. So it highlights, I think, uh, the hypocrisy that we are currently trying to deal with uh, from members of the opposition. Um, ultimately, uh, does all of this speculation impact on confidence? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, do I try to address that through speeches like I gave today and other members of the government? Yes, we do. I would love for... Uh, the two of you as media representatives here today to report on all the positive aspects that I outlined in my speech. I suspect that that probably won't be a key feature of the articles that you write uh, and my comments in relation to leadership will take more precedence. Um, is that a challenge for us? Yes, but I'm not going to moan about it. I say a politician moaning about the journalism is like a ship's captain complaining about the sea. I just, I'm not going to jump into the politics of Australia, but one thing that we are conscious of globally is there's increased political uncertainty and risk, and we've got to factor that in a lot more to our investment decision-making processes around the globe, around the globe. Question. Question over here. Thank you. Um, my name is Mary Simcoe. I'm also from the Department of Economic Development. I'd like to raise the question of leadership and communication. We've had a couple of prime ministers who... Um, had basically a really clear message. I mean, Paul Keating said he wants every taxi driver to understand the exchange rate and interest rates and what they mean and why they are what they are. 
John Howard said he wants Australia to be a large shareholding nation, not just a nation of home ownership. Can either of you um, identify what you would see as the, the compelling communication of a transformation in Australia that a Prime Minister could and should deliver today? <laughs> Thank you very much. You don't look like a 5'8". <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong state for that. Um, the, uh, I just look like I've got a hospital pass on the wing. Um, me giving advice to the Prime Minister on the, on the narrative. Um, wow, that's, a, uh, that's a, a, a really interesting question. The, um, Can I, I go while it's a I, pregnant pause? I was just going to, sorry, Stephen, I, I was going to come back to uh, the fact that, you know, this, that from our perspective, and I know it's a little insular, the, you know, in many cases, the second largest asset that households have is increasingly their superannuation. If it's not today, it might well be soon. Um, so uh, taking an interest in that and thinking about that, how that could be deployed to, you know, ensure that they individually get to retirement is, is important, but then thinking about, and you know, I don't know about playing a role in, uh, because of disintermediate fund managers like us, um, but you know, playing a more ac active role in how that can be deployed in a manner that uh, suits their needs as investors, but actually contributes to the country. I, I know from our perspective, it's an enormous source of pride to say that you know, a number of you, um, you know, might have flown through Melbourne Airport recently, um, you know, we think that's a much better experience than flying through LAX. Uh, and it's also been a fantastic contributor to returns. Um, the Southern Cross station down here, the crime rates have gone down dramatically. The customer experience has improved enormously. And Australian superannuants own it. You know, so putting some real world stuff to what we're doing, you know, it's fantastic that they're getting great returns through their, their funds. But they're also contributing to, to better outcomes through you know, safer, better enterprises and, as I said before, responsible long-term ownership of, of some of these assets that they're using all day, every day. Um, bringing some reality to, uh, to how the superannuation system can help them individually and us collectively would be useful, big task, but useful. I think the challenge for political leadership um, is best summed up by heard it attributed to various people, but a comment, there they go and I must follow for I am their leader. Um, the challenge really is that there's clearly, not just in Australia, but globally in developed nations, a disconnect between community expectations of what governments can deliver and the ability of governments to achieve that. Uh, the bulk of the developed world has run out of public cash. Thanks to the economic prudence of the previous Howard government, and only for that reason, uh, Australia doesn't have debt to GDP ratios uh, of countries uh, in Europe, for example, uh, or the United States. Uh, there can be no doubt, it's an incontrovertible fact, that had the Howard government not paid off uh, the $92 billion of debt, uh, that walking into the last GFC, we today would be in a far worse fiscal position than we currently are because our starting point would have been so much worse. Uh, now faced with the challenge that we have uh, with, with forecasts of budget deficits uh, for many years to come, uh, we have got to grapple with the challenge of uh, letting Australians know that status quo in terms of policy positions are completely unsustainable uh, and we need to make reform. The challenge, clearly, if you look around the world, is that the siren song of saying, there's nothing to worry about, our debt to GDP levels are low, we can just keep going as if the music hasn't stopped, which frankly is the mantra that we hear from the Labor Party and from Clive Palmer, uh, will do nothing other than deliver us to the exact same fiscal position that countries that have already walked down that path have arrived at. So, in my view, uh, if we adopt the same approach that the Europeans adopted, we'll end up at the same destination, destination as the Europeans are at today. Uh, if we recognise the folly of that approach, uh, then we'll end up somewhere else. Um, do I think that the community uh, 
does have a disconnect with what actually fiscally is achievable, I absolutely do. And if you want further evidence of that, look no further than Greece. Uh, the country is effectively bankrupt and the Greek people just elected a party that said we're anti-austerity. So I think we've got to be mindful of uh, the real challenges that we have um, and that's the real challenge for any political leadership irrespective of which side of the political aisle you come from. I think there's a question down the back. We just have to make that the last question. John Allen, um, independent consultant. Minister, in your joint portfolios, you have a ringside seat at what must, by any description, be something of a distraction in terms of Australia's place in Asia right now. Um, one remembers that, that uh, the noise over Barlow and Chambers in Malaysia was nothing like what it is over these two in Indonesia, nor Van Wing in Singapore, but the day after the final scene, it all disappeared from Australian newspapers and nothing more much was said about it. Can you give us some context as Australia's place in Asia in terms of this distraction over the last few weeks? I'm sure you don't mean it in a disrespectful way, but I, I would not use the word distraction. Um, the fact is that uh, these are two Australian citizens who clearly are reformed characters, uh, and uh, the Australian government position under uh, governments of both political colours and flavours uh, has been to oppose the death penalty uh, because it is uh, barbaric. Um, that remains the case, and uh, this government, as indeed did the previous government, uh, has undertaken every endeavour that it possibly can to try to spare their lives. Um, that's not to say that they shouldn't be punished. They themselves acknowledge that. Uh, but we don't believe that Australian citizens should be executed because as a nation we don't believe in the death penalty. What's the impact if we take a worst case scenario on our relationship with Indonesia? I'm not in a position to predict that at this point in time. Uh, we have indicated numerous times that Indonesia is a close friend, that our relationship with Indonesia is important. However, we do not believe it is appropriate or just in this case for Australians to be executed. Thanks, Steve. Look, we'll have to bring it to an end. Uh, we try and pride ourselves on concluding these events uh, on time. Uh, so all that's really left for me to do is to, uh, is to thank both Brett Himbry and Steve Jodo for their time today.